Mexico faculty committee at the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies here at Harvard University. I am thrilled to be hosting and moderating this a talk this evening with Professor Alejandro Rodiles from a professor of international law and global governance at the ETOM School of Law in Mexico City. I'm going to give a little bit of a bio background on Alejandro, but I wanted, I was just telling Alejandro and also our discussant Enrique Silva, whom I will introduce to all of you soon, that um, that this is a perfect day for this event because we are right in the midst of a series of news comments and commentaries coming about coming out about COP26 in Glasgow and people are really interested in questions not only of sustainability and resilience but like the role of international actors and institutions and agencies in setting the agenda for creating a more resilient future for our cities and for our planet. Um, today's talk um, is going to be focusing on Mexico City, shall we say contested urban resilience, Mexico City and global law. As I mentioned, um, I'm just so happy that Alejandro, who is a very busy man and has been around the world and coming back from Germany not so so long ago, now back in Mexico, is, is has agreed to be our speaker today. Um, as I mentioned, he's a professor of international law and global governance at the ETOM School of Law in Mexico City. Um, his uh, prior to this appointment, he was a research fellow at the law faculty of Humboldt University in Berlin and a lecturer at the UNAMS Faculty of Law. He has served as a Mexican diplomat at Mexico's mission to the UN in New York at the end of between 2009 and 2010, and as a delegate to the UN Security Council in the Ministry of Foreign Relations in Mexico City. So also Alejandro worked at the Office of the Legal Advisor at the Policy Planning Staff of the Foreign Ministry. And more recently, he's been a member of the Commission of Admissions to Mexico's Foreign Service. Again, I've mentioned he has a law degree, postgraduate studies in German. He is absolutely the, pers the best person we could think about to think about, to kind of share with us what are the relationships between national state actors, city actors, and global actors. Might I just say a little something before I also introduce Enrique Silva and then turn over the microphone to Alejandro that this talk is one is the third in a series that we've hosted at the Rockefeller Center this fall under the rubric of shifting scales of power. And we've had people talk about the rural settings and we've had people talk about the border settings in the United States. I mean, the US-Mexico border, but we haven't really had anybody who brings the international legal perspective into looking at several scales of power, both the national and the local and Mexico City and that. So we're gonna hear more about that today. Now, after uh, Alejandro gives his presentation, we will hear a commentary from Dr. Enrique Silva, who's the Director of International Initiatives at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and also a fellow uh, professor we've taught together at the GSD and a great um, planner, professor, as well as now program director in a, one of the most important institutes that's kind of really looking at issues of land, also water resilience and other questions, issues that I'm sure Enrique will share with us later. Um, at the Lincoln Institute, Enrique is responsible for the identification and oversight of existing and new initiatives that leverage the Lincoln Institute's resources and expand its presence locally and globally. Silva leads a portfolio of projects and initiatives in Africa and the Middle East, as well as, of course, Latin America, where he has worked extensively. I believe he was the director of the Ford Foundation Ford Foundation office in Chile and has worked across the Americas as well as in Africa and the Middle East. I would also say that um, in addition to kind of his work as a planner and at the Lincoln Institute, he is a global activist. He's very known in planning circles because in that he was one of the few planners setting the new urban agenda that was established several years ago that's part of the global governance regime that we'll be talking about later today. 
Uh, and Enrique holds a PhD in city and regional planning from University of California in Berkeley, as well as a master's in planning from the University of Toronto and a BA in political science from Columbia. Um, so we have like an embarrassment of riches here today, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Alejandro. I do wanna tell people that you can choose the button at the bottom of your screen if you need an interpretation. This will be recorded and presented in English and Spanish. So it's an English presentation, but there will be Spanish translation. And again, if you have questions, you put them to me in the, in the Q&A, and then I will share them with the group after we hear from first Alejandro and then a short commentary from Enrique. So without further ado, welcome, Alejandro. I'm sorry you couldn't be here in Cambridge, but next time. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. Thank you so much for this invitation. It's a great pleasure to join you. Thank you, Enrique, for agreeing to, to do the comments to my presentation. And uh, well, as Diane mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, urban resilience is connected to global law, how many of the measures that are related to, to resilience strategies in several fields at, at the urban level are inspired or come directly from uh, global mechanisms and from global law, as I will define it. And uh, what this means, uh, for urban governance and in this case for Mexico City in particular. And, and for that purposes, I will first give a very brief overview of the role of cities in international law, which is something uh, quite recent. It's, it's a development that has uh, been making a lot of noise in the last five to 10 years, not, not more. Uh, then I will turn over to the framing of the role of cities, not so much within classical international law, but more within global law, global law processes, and what this means for, for the, the agency of cities in uh, global regulation processes, uh, the active role of cities. Then uh, I will turn over to, to Mexico City and, and what does it mean so far from Mexico City? Where do we stand now? How does resilience materialize in Mexico City? Uh, and then finally, in the fi last part, I will talk a little bit about the, the promises and perils of resilience, as, as I call them, and to try to, to wrap up with some concluding thoughts on scales of sovereignty, which I kind of approach here through different scales of jurisdiction and what this means when, especially when we have resilience uh, activities on the ground. Okay, so uh, as to the role of cities in international law, I said, uh, it's, it's, it's a rather recent phenomenon, but we can say that with the urban age, uh, the international law has also been very clearly impacted by, by cities in several and important ways. There is a growing body of literature on, on cities and international law, actually just recently a handbook, a research handbook on international law and cities uh, edited by professors Helmut Aus from Free University of Berlin and uh, Janne Nischmann from the University of Amsterdam just came out uh, one month ago. Also within the International Law Association, which is one of the most important professional uh, associations uh, in international law, there is a new study group on the role of cities in international law, where questions are addressed, such as, for example, are cities come, becoming again uh, uh, new subjects of international law? That means have their rights and obligations under international law? Can they make international law? And, uh, and, and these are the kind of questions that have uh, been addressed in addressed in recent times by international legal scholarship. Um, th there are not really so far concluding findings on this, of, of, on, on this uh, legal technicalities on, on, on the role of cities as new subjects or old new subjects of international law, but there is certainly a growing consensus that uh, cities are now shaping international law, at least in indirect ways, uh, and in speci especially in, in some fields of international law, such as international environmental law, human rights law, and also security law. Um, most interesting, and, and, and that relates to what Diane just mentioned, that uh, we're now uh, witnessing the, uh, the, the COP uh, in, in Glasgow, the Congress of the State's Parties on Climate Change in Glasgow. And uh, uh, it is precisely this area, the climate change law, where we can see the role of cities most prominently. Um, and, and here I, I have to mention the Paris Agreement on Climate Change uh, of 2015, which is 
international treaty governed by international law, by the Vienna Convention on International Law, but it reveals a highly innovative design, this, this agreement, this uh, treaty, in, in many, many ways. But uh, for us, what is important is that it has opened up uh, spaces for what it calls non-party stakeholders. It means that those who are not uh, officially parties to the agreement, that is states, national states, uh, can still participate in, in, in the agreement and try to fulfill the goals. And, and, and this was shown uh, very clearly when the government of Donald Trump uh, denounced the, the, the Paris Agreement and the, the US government went away from the Paris Agreement. And then a coalition of US cities and also states uh, went to the UN Secretariat on Climate Change in Bonn and delivered their pledges. So making a strong uh, signal that they were willing to fulfill the objectives of the climate agreement or to, to work for them in spite of the US government retreating from them. Uh, this is not the first time that something like that happens. So we have also a very interesting case of how the city of San Francisco officially declared to commit to the uh, convention on, on the rights of women, CEDAW convention, despite the US not being a state party to that. So we have many cases and also in other regions of the world where um, the central governments show a rather um, recalcitrant attitude or, or a very uh, parochial attitude towards international law and cities have stepped in to say, well, we will do and, uh, and we will try to fulfill these commitments. But what was significant with the Paris Agreement is that it was international law itself which opened up the spaces technically within the, the design of the treaty to allow for, for, for cities participation uh, by delivering their pledges directly to the UN Secretariat and somehow making them part although not officially parties, but making them part as non-party stakeholders to the treaty. Uh, so uh, these evolutions are all very important, but they leave still many technical legal questions unanswered. And, and we can fairly say that uh, as to the formal status of cities within international law, they're still regarded as subnational entities and their actions are only um, regarded as part of international law as long as they can be attributed to uh, to the state, to the nation, uh, central state as a whole. But, and, and now I'm going to the second point, which is the role of cities in, in, in what like, some of, of us call global law instead of international law, which global law means that we have, we recognize that today we, we're not more in the interstate centered uh, uh, normative realm, that we have much more players and actors and that uh, uh, that non-state actors are growing in importance and, and, and magnitude, and that we have also different kinds of regulation mechanisms, uh, and that there is also a, a, a growing um, entanglement between the different levels of authority, uh, national, subnational, international, global. That, that is what is meant by global law. It's, it's not really a definition, there is no definition on it, but this idea that international law is changing. And, and, and we, when we regard this and, uh, or, or, or view this from this perspective of global law, then, then we can see that maybe this technical question that uh, causes so much headaches to international lawyers on whether cities are or not subjects of international law may not be as relevant as, uh, as, as, this, uh, as it seems beforehand. Um, what we can see is that if the classical sources of international law and the categories of international law cannot longer accommodate this, the growing role of non-state actors and then activities within global governance, then uh, we have to look at, at other ways of, of trying to, to capture this from normative perspective. And that is what is meant by, by global law. So um, just to, to reframe here, international lawyers in a way have a choice to make. They can either stick to the traditional classical ways of contemplating international law with a doctrine of sources and, and, and the categories. Uh, and then probably they will unwillingly have to accept that the role, the importance of international law is shrinking to the interstate domain, which is shrinking. Uh, or they can take the more risky adventure of trying to navigate uncharted waters and try to figure out how all these changes are relating to the world, to the ways that the world is being ruled today. And, and, and in, within this later attitude, this, this more risky attitude, but I think also which is more closely to how the world is today and, and not so much how we can see it from, from the doctrinal perspective, there is where uh, those who engage in global law 
um, uh, situate themselves. And uh, there is where we can have very, very little doubts that cities are becoming uh, growingly important. Um, in, in that sense, uh, we can say that uh, we have this a certain kind of, of, of uh, transition from regarding the cities as places where international law in a way happens, where it is materialized, where it is implemented, and transiting, transiting to an image where international, uh, where cities are becoming active components of international law and shaping it act actively. Um, and, and in that sense, we have also to be very um, sensitive indeed to the different trends that are today in, in, in the ways that the world is being ruled, the, the different normative trends that we have at the global level. Uh, there is actually one, one of the most, uh, um, yeah, one of the best books on global law by Neil Walker from, uh, he's actually from Edinburgh. And uh, he, he talks how we don't have a definition of global law. We have like more of this intimations of what global law is and how it is changing classical international law. And within this, this uh, um, realm, we have to be more sensitive to the different normative global trends that are uh, popping up and that are changing and that are dynamically evolving and, and to be very, very uh, sensitive to the different ways of ruling today. So in, in that sense, global law also means that we have an expanded view of global regulation, which is very much about conducting conduct in also in a Foucauldian sense, and not so much about formal rules that uh, establish a certain action that has to be followed or not. And then there is a section if we don't do that. So moving from that classical, the latter classical scheme to more, uh, to a more open uh, and uh, open textured um, notion of global ruling as conducting conduct also by nudging and, and other kinds of, of uh, normative devices. Um, and within this, uh, I think cities' uh, activities on, on a transporter plane are one example of such global normative trends, one, one clear example of such no, global normative trends. Um, so the role within global law is really not uh, that contested. Um, just to put it very, very uh, bluntly, as, 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 a, as a teacher, if we want to understand today how the global climate change legal regime works, or the global counterterrorism law works, then uh, we have to take cities as, as, as uh, agents, as part and parcel, part, part and parcel of this global uh, normative trends. And uh, sometimes they're even becoming more important than the classical subjects in states and international organizations. Um, so, I mean, of course, there has been already, a, especially in social legal studies, a, uh, the literature has been attentive to the role of cities and how they shape international law from below. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, uh, Balakrishnan Rayagopal has worked on his book, International Law from Below. Um, global city networks are also not that new. We have many, many examples going back to the 70s, etc. Um, but what is changing is that there is a growing intensity in uh, on the, of the interplay that this global city networks that the role of cities uh, have with formal international organizations, with the interstate system as such, how this interplays uh, are, uh, are, are making a difference in how uh, global re regulation happens today, and um, how we can also see a rising level of embeddedness of local authorities with uh, global authorities and local norms with global norms and normative processes. Um, so, in a way, that's why I can say that cities are important spaces where international law happens, but they take actively part as agents in the creation of global law. And I will come back to this issue of agency, which I think is, is really important. Uh, it gives a different perspective, not so much on the formal uh, contemplation of whether cities have rights and obligations in international law, but what, what do they do in terms of global regulation? I will come back to that in the end. Um, now, just to give a, a few examples on, on this, uh, to try to, to be a, a bit more clear um, on this active participation of cities in the making of global law. Um, and then in another piece that I have written, I, I have studied this in the field of global counterterrorism law, where we can see uh, how, whereas in 20 years ago, cities were just the places where 
terrorist and counterterrorism activities happened. Now we have a growing understanding of how cities through uh, the, the diverse practices, also what in relation to the built environment, in relation to, to what happens in terms of urban planning, how they are also uh, creating new uh, normative trends in uh, global counterterrorism -ter law. And this is actually uh, gathered um, systematized, compiled as best practices or good practices by networks such as the Strong City Network. And what is very interesting, and here is where this interplay that I just mentioned come to the forefront, um, the Security Council, the United Nations Security Council through the uh, Counterterrorism Committee and its body of experts, they have uh, increasingly recognized the, the role of urban planning and uh, interventions in the built environment for uh, uh, relevant global counterterrorism practices that they then disseminate and try to, to uh, what they want is that other cities mimic what has been already done in London or in New York, et cetera. And, and they, so they, they become active part of the uh, global regulation on uh, counterterrorism in this case. Here I will focus not on, on terrorism, but much more on sustainable development. Uh, because sustainable development uh, covers practically all areas that we can imagine from security to housing and, uh, and, and highlights their interconnectedness. So I think it's, it's a very fertile ground for studying this. And I, I will focus on what I call the global law of sustainable development. Um, I mean, other scholars talk about the international law or the emerging international law of sustainable development concentrating on the UN 2030 agenda, the sustainable development goals, um, uh, the emerging legal principles that we might have in this emerging legal field. But I prefer to talk about the global law of sustainable development because of course we also take into consideration the, the SDGs, the sustainable development goals of the 2030 agenda. But we, if we talk about the global law of sustainable development, we will look much, much closer into the work of a world wide range of actors at different levels, cities, uh, state governments, international organizations, but also uh, different kinds of actors, uh, local actors, citizens and, and uh, civil society, uh, public par private partnerships, etc., cetera, uh, and their practices. So, so the focus is to go more into a multi-actor and multi-level game of different actors and to focus more on what they do on their practices and not so much on emerging legal principles and, and rules, et cetera. So it is a global law of sustainable development that is not interstate centric, uh, that, that looks much more, as I, as I said, a multi-level and multi-actor approach, which has been also called a whole of society approach, which really incorporates uh, uh, the whole of society beyond governments and crucially, mundane practices, day-to-day -day practices, which I think it's, it's very important. Um, so um, what has happened in this sense in, in, in Mexico City and, uh, and it's global law to, to, to call it like this. We have seen that Mexico City has from the governments of Marcelo Ebrard on uh, uh, um, portrayed itself as a La Ciudad Global de México, La Ciudad de México Global, um, with some important interventions and uh, also in the built environment that were inspired by these global evolutions. Um, and when in 2017, the, the Mexico City's constitution was adopted, there were some very clear references to the right to the city, globally inspired, or uh, there is a whole article with many, many, uh, a very long article on the global city. Uh, it's article 20. Uh, we have lots of articles referring to the inclusive city, the secure, the safe city in line with SDG 11. Th that has already been, like I said, an evolution that comes from the era of, Man of Ebrat and Mancera. During Mancera's uh, administration, we had actually a resilience office within the government of Mexico City, which was very interesting, but it was at the same time part of the 100 resilient network, this uh, Rockefeller Foundation funded uh, network. And uh, uh, all this were dismantled with uh, the government of uh, Claudia Sheinbaum. Um, I think it has a lot to do with the um, 
attachment to the fourth transformation, to the Cuarta Transformación and, and the close uh, relationship she has with, uh, with AMLO. And in a way, uh, within this ideology, this left-wing ideology, globally stylist rhetoric of a global city was not much welcome. So there is very little rhetoric on this. Uh, like I said, this office of resilience was dismantled and also because of the austerity measures of the fourth transformation and so on and so forth. But what has happened in practice is that uh, Claudia Sheinbaum's administration has been um, very much uh, inspired by uh, this uh, kind of uh, measures uh, that come from global, uh, from the global law of sustainable development. Um, I mean, on the one hand, we have an active participation in, in city coalitions, uh, but her government has also adopted transversal poly uh, policies, which clearly reflect the the SDGs, especially SDG 11 on safe, inclusive and uh, sustainable cities and, and several of its targets. For instance, the, the mobility strategy of Mexico City that has been uh, driven by Andres Lajus uh, is, is very much driven as much as by traffic congestion reduction measures as by violence reduction at the same time, gender considerations and inclusion. Um, we have the 2019 strategy for gender and mobility, which also aims at fostering an institutional culture, which means also that gender parity measures within the public transport system uh, are also aimed at an overall trust building and bridging between the citizenship and the local authorities. Um, there is no word on, on the sustainable development goals on, on SDG 11 in particular, but the strategy as such can be read as a case in point for, for the implementation of SDG 11. We have other examples such as uh, this program Sendera Camina, Sendero Camina Segura, which Linkage with, with, uh, also shows important linkages with um, with the uh, SDG Accelerator Lab in Mexico City, which is uh, driven by the UNDP and which tries also to look into um, uh, by gathering big data and then try to look at positive divines uh, features and how they can uh, foster the way for uh, the secure uh, movement of women. And, and this has been also taken up by this program, this governmental program of Sendero Camina Segura. Um, we can also speak of Sheinbaum's uh, intervention, strategic in, in investment uh, and, and policies in, on infrastructure, especially at the poorest parts of the city in Iztapalapa, Iztacalco, and so on and so forth, where we can clearly see how there, there are good practices for ensuring access to adequate, safe, and affordable services, uh, how this has been done, as I said, in the most marginalized areas of the city, so in the sense, upgrading slums, and contributing in our world to the integration of the of a fragmented urban landscape and life. Um, another example in this way of, of, of resilience measures at the local level is, for example, what the Under Secretary for Citizens Participation and Crime Prevention of the Secretaría de Seguridad Ciudadana has been doing with se several measures that uh, are related to and strategies that are related to trust building, horizontal bridging, and disrupting what can be called the negative resilience of criminal organizations and, 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 and their allegiance to the neighborhoods. This is, for example, the case of the program Barrio Adentro. So all these measures, I think they can be really be seen as efforts of translating governance norms and practices into improved local living conditions. And in that sense, they can be seen as instances of implementation of the SDGs, in particular SDG 11, but also SDG 5 on gender equality, or also as effective implementation of other resilience uh, toolkits that have been delivered and have been, uh, uh, been prominent in Mexico, for example, in the framework of the Merida Initiative, its fourth pillar in particular. And I think that Diane has a lot uh, to comment on this because she, she has been actively involved in some of these uh, uh, recommendations. Um, now, uh, so I have three minutes. Okay, that's uh, okay. Uh, so let me um, now turn on to, to how I see these this promises and, and, and perils of resilience. So, um, I mean, this is all very nice and, 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 and it has definitely contributed to better living conditions on the ground, to a 
better integration of the urban landscape. I think that, that, that we can fairly speak of that today in Mexico City. We're already seeing uh, um, a, a, a clear uh, reduction of crime in Mexico City. And uh, so I, I don't have anything against these measures of resilience that are globally inspired and, and how they, they, they contribute locally to, to improvement of, of local life. Um, but what is my preoccupation, let's put it this way, is that um, resilient, these kinds of resilience measures sometimes tend to um, diffuse the responsibility of authorities. And, and for that, let me give you an example. And another of these measures that have also been uh, done recently in, in partnership with a uh, with a non-for-profit organization, Isla Urbana, is the uh, program uh, Cosecha de Lluvia, or the Rain uh, Water Harvesting Program of Mexico City, which uh, harvests rainwater and in that sense uh, secures that, uh, especially in those parts of the city where there is uh, prolonged uh, droughts and, 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 and shortages of, of water supply, that they have access to water over the year. Um, this has been done, like I said, in partnership with an NGO, with a, a not-for-profit organization called Isla Urbana, which has been doing this for very successfully for 20 years now or more. And um, recently there was a, a TV uh, program and, and, and there were some people from Isla Urbana. And then when the moderator was praising the government of, uh, of Claudia Sheinbaum, of, uh, because she was working together with Isla Urbana on this uh, rain water harvesting program. And, and, and the representative from uh, Isla Urbana said, well, she has no other choice and, and the government has no other choice because they have been failing for, for many years and now they don't have an alternative. They have to resort and come to us and to, uh, to rely on the, on the mon mundane practices that emerge spontaneously from, from the people. And I think that this is a very potent critique, not, so, not, so, uh, not only looking backwards to say what, has been, what hasn't been done uh, in, in, in all these years, uh, but also uh, in terms of, 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 of the future of fertility and, and what this means if we resort to these kinds of resilience measures, which, are, which emerge from spontaneously from the ground, from the people, and how the government in a way also is giving up or not investing so much energy and, 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 uh, and resources on making big plans for the future and trying to solve problems on a longer term. And here's where probably the mentalities of urbanists and, and, and lawyers diverge or not. I would be very uh, interesting to see this in the discussion. But as a lawyer, I... Uh, I feel a little bit uncomfortable with this. I, I, I feel a little bit that uh, this in a way could betray what Hannah Arendt mentions that is the, one of the main functions of law that is the collective political act of promising and, and of giving promises for the future and how this builds communities uh, and, and collectivities over time. And, and, and this is what uh, worries me when uh, the local government, the local authorities, resort more and more to this resilience initiatives, which are clearly inspired by the SDGs and by all this global law and global discourses on good urban governance and how in a way this could uh, suspend their responsibility or diffuse their responsibility to such a degree where nobody knows who is really uh, responsible for what. And, if, and, and just to finish, this relates also to the issue of, of scaling or of, of different scales. If we talk about scales of sovereignty, we also know that as a lawyer, that, that means we talk about the different kinds of jurisdictions that are out there. Jurisdiction means basically to state the law and to sanction the law. And we know this is usually circumscribed to different spatial temporalities, uh, the local, the national, the international, uh, the high seas where there's actually no jurisdiction, but it's also good exemplification of this. And um, if we think of the scales of sovereignty as scales of jurisdiction, and then we look at what is happening in urban governance by this globally inspired measures, but which actually happened through the spontaneous practices of people on the ground, then we can see actually very good how this scales become diffuse, how we have actually resilience is about a collective agency, a collective act of 
stating and executing or sanctioning the law. And uh, well, this might be in a way inevitable today in our Anthropocene and, and, and global condition. There are sometimes problems that uh, have to be solved in a more traditional way of uh, scales of jurisdiction from the federal to the local to the municipal, especially if we want to make this bigger plans for the future and try to resolve issues not so much on the spot and the here and now, but much more as, uh, uh, as, as plans over time. And, and what this means also for, for the making of collectivities over time. So uh, I think I already took too much time and uh, I apologize for that, but uh, very happy to go back to, to any questions and answers on, on this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alejandro. And uh, first, uh, a, a really heartfelt thank you to uh, the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies, and in particular, Diane um, and Mauricio and uh, all of the colleagues um, in, uh, at the center, both in Mexico and Cambridge. Uh, very big thank you to you, Alejandro, for a stimulating and thought-provoking presentation. And, um, and it's, been, it's really a pleasure to meet uh, you for the first time and meet a colleague in a discipline with which I don't uh, tend to interact too much, uh, but um, see that we clearly share mutual interests around resilience, cities in general, uh, in particular, effective governments. And, and I think the rules of the games that shape actions and agenda that um, are either at the international level, global level, or at the local. Um, before diving into my commentaries or discussion questions, I, I, I want to establish a couple of things about myself and, and that I think may help you understand where my observations are coming from. Uh, first, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I'm a planner. Uh, I've never tried to play a lawyer. Um, and so I might be missing some of the concepts or basic understandings of the mechanics of international law. Uh, and so I might have some blinders here uh, with that, that background that um, um, Alejandro uh, brings us, gives to us. Um, but I am a planner and an urbanist with a very deep interest in, in how cities function, how they govern themselves and the way that they uh, condition and the, and the well-being of, of people. And it's from that perspective that I'm keenly interested in understanding how cities look like from the perspective of international law and scholars like Alejandro. So this is a wonderful session for me. I'm learning a tremendous amount. Clearly, the world of cities and urban policy uh, and international law have been and are intermingling. Mingling. Uh, uh, we've got a really good history contextualized that um, from Alejandro. Um, and the big question is now still for me is how do we see one another? How do cities see the international? How does the international see cities? But in particular, how do lawyers see cities and how do urbanists see the law? <laughs> Um, I think that's going to be important to tease out um, if we want to come together to talk about what is and is not working with, uh, within the realm of urban resilience. The third is that I come to Alejandro's work and research interests from the perspective of one of those actors who has ventured into the international policy world, as, as Diane mentioned, uh, and I was specifically engaged in uh, developments around the Agenda 2030, but specifically uh, in the lead up to Habitat 3 and the launching of the new urban agenda back in 2016. Uh, I was a member of the General Assembly of Partners of the UN Habitat, which gave me access to the drafting table of the reports and declarations that shaped the new urban agenda. Um, and I am currently now participating in international award initiatives, such as the Guangzhou Urban Innovation Award, that seeks to identify many of the things that um, um, Alejandro was talking about, uh, to identify and celebrate the ways that cities are innovating to solve transcendental societal and environmental problems. These are awards that see cities as sites of innovation and their leaders and citizens as change agents. And in particular, what's interesting in the last two cycles of the awards, the, the, uh, there has been a particular emphasis to see and celebrate the way cities have broken away from national governments to embrace the SDGs, just as Alejandro was talking about, not just San Francisco, uh, New York City uh, and Los Angeles, for example. My fourth and final piece of background, um, and this is where, well, there's no, is, is about literature and my own way of thinking of some of the issues that um, Alejandro is also grappling with. And I, Alejandro's work it really made me focus or reminded me of a, a literature that I really much appreciate within planning, and that's the literature around policy mobility and policy circuits. Um, and, and I'm thinking in particular about works by Eugene McCann, Kevin uh, Ward, and Patsy Healy. These are works on how and why ideas and practices are assembled and then made to travel. They move, they go from one place to another. Think here the Barcelona model, the Medellin model of uh, 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 social urbanism. 
bus rapid transit, cycle superhighways. These are policies that are have an origin and then travel and are sold in many ways, to put it crudely, to other cities. What I appreciate about this body of work and literature is that it takes the eye, your eye off of the policy or practice and focuses on the actors and the supply demand dynamics of policy consumption and reproduction. What does that mean? In a very simple way, it means we need to look at who is bundling first the innovation or the idea or the policy or, um, in a particular place. Then who are the actors that actually sell it and pitch it to someone as a product? Um, and then within that, who are the actors that are receiving it or creating the demand for that? And then who are the actors that bring it to the ground and implement them? These are analysis that, at least for me, help to understand how ideas travel, how they morph, why they may never be applied the same way in one or two places. And this can mean that they fail somewhere else, or it can mean that they flourish and become even better somewhere else. And, and so, but there, the, the whole idea is not, you know, don't, don't focus so much on the policy, but look at the actors that are involved. Um, because when you look at the actors that are involved in, this, in the policy circuits and the mobilities, how they travel, where they go, whether it's from the city, Mexico City, to Geneva or to Nairobi, uh, for a UN Habitat meeting, it starts, you, you want to ask, what's their motivation? Why are they doing this and for whom? Um, and then if you focus on agency and motivation, then you get to, into a conversation around power and capacity. Power to demand and seek an idea, power to provide a product and sell it, and the power to translate it in a place or site. And I think that's many of the things that you were saying it towards the end of your presentation. So wh where am I going with this? Today, what has caught my attention are issues along three themes, and I've kind of already laid them out. Actors and players, which is different than agency, which I think you covered quite clearly. There is an agency there, but I, I, what I really want to focus on and understand better is who are the actors and players in the, in the tableau that you've painted, um, and at different moments. The other theme is motivation. What is motivating these actors? And then the final one is, and it goes to the point of, of, your, fine, of your, last, um, your, your last set of comments and examples from Mexico City, are the themes of autonomy and accountability. I'm particularly interested in the issues of autonomy and accountability at the urban level, but you're raising really interesting questions about autonomy and accountability at the international level, especially with the issue around whether or not the international legal regime will decide whether or not to keep on going the status quo or take those risks that you were mentioning. But first, I want to know who those actors are and what might be motivating them to understand whether or not they might take the risks. Um, on, on motivation, I'm, I'm left wondering, again, why are the actors involved in global urban policy and law, especially the cities? What's in it for them? Um, what, brings the, what brings a representative of the city to the international policy table? And I actually, one of the things that I want to, I'm going back to actors, especially the ones that participate, are the actors that are involved in the, at the international level, the same actors that come back and implement the policies? Or are they different? And, and is there, a, what are the implications if they are different actors? Those that negotiate and, and, and um, advocate and those that actually implement. But going back to on motivation, um, again, what brings the city to the international table? What prompts actors driving the international legal system and policy arena to open the doors to cities? And I think this is one of the things that you say you're interested in exploring, and I would love to explore that with you as well. But what your conversation, your, your topic has made me think about, and it brought me back to issues uh, that I, I saw in, um, at Habitat, and one of the most fascinating dynamics uh, at Habitat in the lead up, those two to three years leading up to Quito in 2016, was the interplay between national governments and city representatives of the same country. And oftentimes you had countries advocating to get rid of or to minimize the voice of cities from their own country. And that gave you insights into the political dynamics of city governments that might be the in the opposition to the national governments and that or and so forth. So there's something there. And then the question is what's motivating these two actors from the same country in the international forum and what are they doing there? And are they there for domestic reasons, whether it's the urban, you know, is it a domestic dynamic that's being played out there or is there something else? Or are they fully representing the country and their cities? Um, and then finally on autonomy and accountability, 
when what you're describing in Mexico City is, I th in my mind, it's as much about international law as it, as it is about the fundamental questions around autonomy and local governments have or don't have to enact and follow through on policies and their own agenda. Uh, what's fascinating about Mexico City in particular is now you have your own constitution, you have a different level of autonomy, what's going to happen, it, does that change the dynamic, does that change, will that change the dynamics going forward as, uh, as, an, uh, as an actor on the international stage. Um, I'm asking all of this because I also share an interest in understanding why some of these policies fail or become wildly successful at whatever scale we're talking about. Um, and I'm also wondering, and this is you know, what you, your, your talk left me wondering is whether cities would initiate or develop resilience policies in the absence of international law. And this is the but for question. <laughs> Are they doing urban resilience? Would, would they do it but for the international law or would they be doing it again? And, and I think this goes to the, your, your original point about the dynamics and the, it's almost a chicken and egg. Where are these ideas coming from? Um, and again, I think the answer comes through understanding and going very specifically to the actors and the motivations of the actors uh, to see where the, um, the origin of um, some of these ideas are. And again, the, the, the capacity to implement the vision or not. Um, so I'll leave it there. A lot of questions, but I, uh, hopefully the conversation will revolve around themes that you already set, which were about the actors and the players, their motivation, and this broader concept of autonomy and accountability. And obviously, we're talking about it at different scales of sovereignty. Thank you so much. This has been really, really enjoyable, and I, I look forward to the next 15 minutes or so. Yeah, let me just thank you, both of you, Alejandro, for a great presentation and Enrique for really pushing, pushing the envelope a little bit more with some amazing questions, which I know the audience wants to hear. I also, you kind of jump started me on a few. I'm going to turn it over to Alejandro now to give up maybe a, a response to some of these. I mean, we could be here for an hour answering that question and we'd love to be here for an hour, but maybe say a little something in response to um, Enrique's excellent questions. I already see, I would like to pose a question or two maximum. And then we have already several questions in the chat that might build on some of these things. So um, I'll turn it over to you to Alejandro, give you some, some space to, to respond to Enrique. Yes, thanks, thanks Anne. And, and thank you so much Enrique. These are really great questions and, and uh, um, I think that they really go into the into into the heart of of, of, of the questions that I'm concerned with. Uh, first, a little bit also for clarification matters. So, how how do cities look like from international law or for international lawyers? And here's what I think: we have basically two uh, two major perspectives. The one is a more classical, traditional, international legal perspective, where most of my colleagues are still uh, attached to, and, and which ask questions like, are the cities becoming new subjects of international law, as they used to be a long, long time ago. So have their rights and obligations under international law. And then there, the Paris Agreement in, in, indeed was a breaking point because then they have a, a, an international legal instrument, which in a strange way, but opens up the space for cities to take part in a treaty, which is contrary to the to the very basics of treaty law. So, so that's, that's one, one stream of, of the literature, which I think is interesting and in that they have the points, but they will probably never go around the issue of attribution of, of, the, of the very technical uh, rules of attribution of conduct to the state, which are very strong. Um, but this is maybe important for international court or for, for international court and tribunals. But if we try to look more into what global regulation means in the sense of what are the different kinds of normative devices employed today that in a way rule the world and, and that, that, that conduct behavior on a transnational scale and which are not necessarily attached to these formal schemes of, uh, of a norm per permitting or prohibiting something and there is a sanction, but which is more, much more about inducing behavior. And there, I think that those international lawyers who take more part of this view of global regulation or seeing international law today more as a kind of global regulation, uh, flag, more flexible, more uh, uh, diffuse in a way. Here we, we certainly see that cities are becoming key actors in making that kind of global regulation. Whether it, is it anti, uh, global uh, counterterrorism law or climate change law. Actually then 
what we see is that uh, there is a wonderful article by Kenneth Abbott who talks about the transnational regime complex for climate change and, and where cities are one of the key players. So, so they're one of the key players within a regime complex. And, 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 and we have this regime complexes more and more and more and more areas of international law. And in all these complexes, cities and other actors have a very active role. That's why I say they have agency, they do things, they change things, they're active players and not only passive bystanders. Uh, so, so, so that would be on how do we see cities today. I think that, that there are these two major perspectives. Um, then to ask about this instances of urban resilience and, and would there be there, uh, are they there because of international law or despite international law? That, that is a question that I have asked myself several times also. And I, I think that they're actually there, that, that they're, Quite many of them, this, many of these things are spontaneous uh, local practices which don't need the global to in order to to happen. They 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 will happen. They will emerge. What we see now is that these kinds of spontaneous practices are being mapped, systematized, and then the few uh, then they are sold, they're, they're transmitted uh, as global good practices on that or that thing. Uh, and, and in that sense, it, that is where they become globalized and there was actually also become part of a certain kind of global regulation because good practices are a way of regulating the world. So, so look what Medellin is doing with their with a cable buses. Now Mexico City does it as well. So we have a good practice. It shows that it is not only good for mobility, but it is also good against violence, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it, it is this globalization of local practices, what is actually interesting. But I think that once they're globalized by the United Nations through the SDGs or by other means, by the networks, et cetera, once they're globalized, they probably also become something else. And, and once they are mimicked around the world, they're not such spontaneous local measures anymore. And that is what I think that the, the urban travels to the global and we have this, this different kind of scales. Uh, and yes, of course, you're right. When we talk about this agency, we have to talk, ask also questions of power and uh, uh, who can do this and, and why do they do this? And uh, sometimes it may show certain kind of power limits on the local level so that there is resort to this kinds of, or, or this attachment to, to, to this collective agency because there is little imagination on behalf of local authorities. But on the other way, it can also be a way of trying to circumvent constraints by the national authorities or the uh, supra authorities on the national level. Mexico City might be a very, very interesting case in point for a mixture of both of them, because I think that Claudia Sheinbaum's uh, government has a very schizophrenic relationship with the national government. Uh, so where we can see both of that at the same time, uh, but in a very, very interesting way play. Um, and I think I would leave it there so we have more time for other questions. I mean, I could go on and on. You have put such amazing questions and uh, I thank you so much and, and I hope to have the chance to, to speak with you on this <laughs> later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro. Well, I'm going to, um, I have like two very general questions that I'd like to pose to you and then one after we hear from you, I will read some of them. They may be setups for the questions in the Q&A. But I guess the, the first question, and they're all very large questions, just as Enrique said, but I, I am very much interested in, given that you've been in Germany, you got your degree, a law degree in Germany, you know the German context, and you're now writing about Mexico and Mexico City, I'm really interested in thinking about the relations, the tensions as you mentioned, as well as possible synergies between the urban and the national in those two different contexts. So there's a global law, there's of course the SDG 11 puts cities and communities on the agenda, which is part of the governance regime. This has been pushed as much by the global north as it is by, by the global south, in part because of different histories, economic and developmental histories. But I guess I, I wanted to probe you a little bit more about where you see the whether there it, this is going to be a more problematic relationship between the city, the nation, and the global law, the three skills you mentioned, in the context of Latin America as opposed to Europe. 
because you know both places. And in particular, maybe there's something peculiar about Mexico. Mexico is not the same, shall we say, as Argentina. Um, it's a federal system, as is Germany a federal system, but it's also a huge nation with a history of concentration of politics and power in a city, even though it, it has a kind of uh, lip service for federalism. So, I mean, there are different political tra traditions and regimes. So my first question is maybe saying a little bit more about the difference, you know, how you understand Mexico and its challenges in the context of what you know about a European country, because I think that would be super helpful. The second question that I wanted to ask you, it's very, I, one of the reasons we got a chance to know each other is because of your work on insecurity and terrorism and global law and terrorism. And you you are an author of books about you know law with respect to the kind of violence and terrorism. You are now also working on vulnerabilities, environmental vulnerabilities. I'm pushing you on this because I've been the chair of a program here or the co-chair of a program at the GSD on risk and resilience where we actually tried to start a conversation about parallels between eco ecological vulnerabilities and violence. And I, I wanna take this opportunity to ask you a little bit more from the legal perspective, first of all, what is the overlap in thinking about global law with respect to terror and how it lands in a city and the global environmental law. And let me just say that I'm, I'm, I'm inspired because even in your comments about um, what's happening under Scheinbaum in Mexico City, there's an institutional connection of those things. You mentioned Andres Lajou's project where you put a multiplicity of vulnerabilities in the same um, agency or in the same discourse. So it's actually happening on the ground, but whether is that just a kind of device, a device to respond to the variety of vulnerabilities that residents in Mexico are carrying out? Do they see a connection between violence and environmental vulnerability? Selling, stealing water, maybe, I don't know. What is the kind of intellectual relationship between your work on terrorism and violence and environment, both at the scale, the, the legal scale, but also in, in the Mexican context. Okay, so, so great and difficult questions, Diane, thank you. Um, so on, on the tensions between the urban and the national and, 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 and how this relates to Europe or, or whether there are differences with Europe, I think that, um, they're, they're, I, I see that, uh, I mean, when, when cities and the local levels start to engage in all these different kinds of things through or guided by, by the technique of resilience, I mean, this is on the one hand a very powerful tool, but it also, uh, it, it's tricky because, because it also, I mean, resilience, we always say that resilience is a, uh, uh, it's a way of coping with risks and with vulner vulnerabilities, but often for resilience to arise, we need already some certain kinds of capabilities there, especially when we talk about the kinds of resilience measures that are uh, sponsored, triggered, or in a way sponsored uh, by, by, by governments. And, and here I think that there might indeed be very, very different kinds of preconditions of, 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 of previous settings, which allow for a smoother way of doing this kind of spontaneous government's practices when you have settings where, uh, first of all, where there is more trust in authorities and where there is a better relationship between the different levels of authority. And of course, this is something that you have much more uh, also with many problems, but you have clearer in Europe. Uh, maybe on the, on the issue of the cooperation between the different levels of authority, not so much because their federalism is indeed sometimes a big problem. We've seen this with, with the COVID-19 epidemic management in, in certain parts of Europe, but there, but, but there is indeed a much more um, institutionalized relationship between different authorities and between also the people and the authorities. And, and I think this, in a way, paths the way a little bit for this 
resilient techniques to to arise without causing so much problems or tensions between still the, the hardware of of, of 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 authorities that we need there to be and to function smoothly and between them and and actually in mexico city you could see that too because where do resilience initiatives have a certain kind of success well in mexico city <laughs> if you go to other places you probably don't have the uh, the ecosystemic conditions to to have these kinds of practices happening in a, in a smoother way where they, they they do deliver positive responses but at the same time don't cause so much tensions to to, to the frameworks that are already there so I, I think that mexico city shows in that way that here we have also this already installed capabilities for for these kinds of of, of uh, things to arise and to happen with less tensions that instead in other places where, where we don't have this, this kinds of, um, of background. And, and I, I think that, that that might be indeed a little bit confirming your concern on, on how this relates differently in, depending on the, yeah, on, on the capacities that are already installed in, 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 in the different parts. And, and, and on the second questions on the insecurity and, and terrorism and how this relates to the global, I mean, uh, on the one hand, uh, of course, those who do global counterterrorism law, they, they, they are more security concerned and, and they don't see so much the connections with uh, environmental issues besides uh, perhaps for things like migration and what climate change do to migrations and how this can become a, a security issue. But beyond that, I don't see that, that there is really so much interconnectedness uh, between the different fields of law. Uh, but I think that the connections are there, for example, within the SDGs, which connect everything together. So, so there is clearly, uh, I mean, measures uh, that are uh, proposed for reducing uh, or for, for, for improving uh, uh, mobility are also at the same time meant to uh, reduce gender inequality and to reduce violence. And they have to do with, with peace and justice. And so there we have this really holistic approach to all these different uh, goals of sustainable development, especially when if we look into the targets and the indicators for complying with those targets, then we see that, that there is indeed an ecosystem which, in the end, everything depends on any on everything else. Um, and, and and so within the global law of sustainable development, I would say yes, there we clearly see that there that there are these connections, where the securitization of development is also there but in a more positive light if you would, uh, if you could put it like this uh, I don't, i'm not so sure if it's really in a more positive light but it, it appears to be in a more positive light, light but there is a securitization of development within the sdgs for, for for sure and if you ask on on my perspective coming from mexico city and you mentioned water and i would say yes there you have the example where you can really see how these things are connected with each other uh, um, we already have instances of, of, uh, of, of uh, organized crime stealing water and selling water pipes and uh, organizers and delivering their infrastructures around a, a black water market. And uh, this is something that probably would, won't, won't be so easy to erase or to, to counter just depending on the kind of resilience initiatives like Isla Urbana and, and, and Cosecha de Yuga. Here's where I think we need better, bigger plans in order to have a, an infrastructure of water that really uh, is uh, uh, capable of, uh, yeah, of, 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 of resisting the emergence of illegal water infrastructures in Mexico City, which could be eventually really, really, uh, very very dangerous if, if, if organized crime if water becomes a new uh, the, the new uh, preferred activity of, of organized crime that that can really be something it, it could bring violence to another level I think um, so yes that, that that would be my no that's a great answer and I'm not I, I think I, I very much like the concept of legitimacy and a kind of how that's kind of the groundwork for kind of moving forward some of these goals. Let me also say that I liked very much um, in talking, I mean, you by bringing the SDG goals down to what's happening in the Secretary of Mo Mo Mobility, Andres, my former student from MIT, by the way, 
but um, that if, if SDG 11 is talking about making cities inclusive, safe, and sustainable, then you pull the all, throw them all together in the same organization. One could ask a question from the planning or the political science perspective, how much traction can you have by uniting all three of those things together? But I do agree with your analysis that there is a need to integrate SDG 11 with the others. And so maybe this is something very, uh, hopefully some of our students can look into this more, the way in certain agencies in these cities that are pushing this agenda, actually try to link those SDG goals. So thank you so much. I'm going to read there one or I don't know, Enrique might want to have a comment, but I'm going to hold off on you because we trying to wrap it up but for in like maybe 10, 15 minutes. But we have a question from Sandra Camacho Otero, who made first a comment in the chat about the resiliency office was moved inside the civil protection ministry. So this is speaking to the kind of um, you know, the kind of intermixing of these different objectives when the, they lost the money from the Rockefeller Foundation. But Sandra also asked then about financing and money. It's a very important question. So how is this, how are these, these kind of international goals and aims going to be financed sustainably? It's a general question for everybody, but Sandra also mentions in a middle-income country as part of the OECD, Etc. So, and that might actually have something to do with the relationships between the city and the nation with respect to where does the money come for, for these things. So do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I haven't done research on that, but I, but I think that is indeed one of the problems with the SDGs. If you look at SDG 17 and how it, it, it uh, creates all this infrastructure of implementation relying on the building of different kinds of partnerships and how here the private sector obviously becomes more and more important. And um, I, I think here you have the perils. I mean, you have the risks that uh, what happens if you have a not so friendly US government towards the kinds of civil society organizations that you need to support in Mexico? Uh, or what does it happen when, for example, the, the, the 100 resilient city network doesn't have the, uh, the the money anymore, and uh, so I, I think that this is certainly one of of the risks of relying so much on this partnership for um, for implementing the SDGs uh, or this partnership building. On the other hand, I also see that of course there are lots of opportunities here. Um, so that that would be my my, my prompt reaction. But uh, I haven't done really research on the financing of this. But uh, of course, this is highly important. But maybe that's an invitation to Enrique because Enrique <laughs> knows something about financing. Enrique, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Um, but before that, the, the, the quick point that I wanted to make um, on the on the on the, the that bun policy bundling of all of the SDGs, which I, I, I if I'm re reading everyone, you're very skeptical, and there's a reason for that because it's a just too much of a mismatch. What's interesting, so what Los Angeles is doing, and New York did it as well. It, it's really interesting. Their policy is not let's do all of the SDGs. What they're doing with the SDGs is monitoring them, setting up a system to monitor their performance in relationship to the indicators that have come under the SDGs, which then inform how they do their policy. So it doesn't create something new. It's really a, it's a data point and it's a feedback mechanism to, to, to think about how their policies do or don't address or whether or not they are institutionally capable of addressing some of the things. So it comes from monitoring. So that was, that was one point. On the financing, uh, one of the things that we tried to do while we were with, as an institute that we were um, advocating for, and um, to a certain degree, were able to put um, into the um, into um, influence some of the, um, the the new urban agenda, was to um, latch onto the habitats concern over municipal fiscal health and own source revenues for municipalities to just finance urbanization in general, and within that. The, the 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 institute's perspective given our mission and our body of work was specifically to look at land value capture or land-based financing and property taxes as sources for revenues for the whatever the policy was with that land value capture the 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 proposition there is for governments to pay attention to whatever action that they're doing to address whatever dimension of the sdgs or, re, or resilience whether it's investment in 
um, improving a watershed, an urban watershed, investing in parks and so forth. Those are those create value to private property owners, and you have mechanisms to recover the fundings to fund uh, the, the intervention or generate revenues for others. So there are mechanisms. It's and there is a large, there is now a very big debate that uh, talking about COP, the you know local level financing of climate adaptation, and the, it's a huge gamut, and it's a debate about whether cities can go into or should go into debt, or do they try to build the systems that allow them to do more land-based finance, re you know, land-based revenue generation, or, and ideally, as we probably all know, a mix of those things. Um, but it's very much in, in the minds because none of these activities, you know, the, 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 the best plans are the ones that have money and can be done. Uh, and it's, but it's very much a debate that's, it, it's ongoing now. We had, a, we had a session just yesterday, not even 24 hours ago on exactly this. How are we going to finance climate adaptation from the city's perspective? Yeah, I mean, let me say that maybe leads to one more question we have from the chat and with a, a short preface, which is, I mean, some of the monitoring you mentioned, Enrique, is intended in order to get funds to finance. So if you show you're following through, you get money. Then there's the second strategy, which you mentioned, which has to do with like innovation investment, usually private sector driven, though the public sector is really important in that. It does raise questions then about kind of potential pushback from the nation, because I mean, this comes the global city, real estate. I mean, there are all sorts of technology, all sorts of ways in which making cities more sustainable is an invitation to private sector, which is a, a general issue, but in the context of AMLOS Mexico, it's a question. So there is, just to build on that, there is a question from the, in the chat from Sharon Welch. Thank you, Alejandro explanation point. In a model in which cities have power to directly influence global law, transcending their relationship to the nation, what happens with rural agency? How does a global city network function differently in countries with higher rural populations? Which I think is another way of thinking about not the rural as an alternative to the city, but like the nation responsible for the entire territory as opposed to the city. So do you have some thoughts on that? Yes, I mean, th there is actually already a, 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 a quite a recurrent critique in, in, in the literature on, on cities and international law, which is that it is actually a quite elitarian project because it, it leaves rural areas behind and it tends to favor those uh, places where you have already um, rich cities in place that can take part in these several networks and, and and, and, and influence in that kind of this, this, this global law. So, so there, there, there is indeed a very legitimate concern about this. And I think uh, it, it is to a certain extent true. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, I, I've just, I've just uh, wrote a piece uh, together with a, with a German colleague, with Helmut Aus on, on, on uh, development and, and, and the role of cities in international development law. And what we try to say there is that we shouldn't, and, and I think this also, is in a way connected to, to the thesis of, 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 uh, of uh, Raya Gopal and others, which is don't look only at what local governments do in it, but look also at the local practices that emerge in it, which are that sometimes going beyond the, 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 the city elites and, and the centers of power, or economic power, et cetera, within the cities. Uh, what does happen in Xochimilco? What does happen in Tlalpan? So to try to go beyond that. And, and then we, uh, we see also that there are indeed uh, emerging practices of, of development also coming from, from the broader uh, um, cities and, 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 and that there are more connections with the rural areas. But I think in the end, yes, it's true, of course, that, that this can also be seen as an elitarian project. On the other hand, I think that also the dynamics between um, the influence of cities on global law and how global law influence cities. I mean, it, it's no one way street. It actually goes both ways. And this connects to, to another question that Enrique made that I want to answer because he asked, well, how do I see the, the new constitution of Mexico City? And what does, what do these norms on global, on the global city, et cetera, do to Mexico City? And I mean, of course, on a way, so, uh, it, it was a very um, a political move by, by Mancera back then, et cetera, to, uh, to put it on a positive light. Also, it's a way of, of, of profiling majors, et cetera, all, all that we already know. But on the other hand, what we've seen today is also that this, uh, this article on the right to the city in Mexico City's constitution, uh, which 
sounds very nice, but everyone was saying, well, how will did uh, work in practice? And now we see the UNDP saying, well, you have the right to the city in your constitution. So now you have to do things in order to, uh, to let women live the city and, and, and live this right to the city. And, and, and then in that light, they are proposing uh, concrete measures on, um, on improving gender equality in the city, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it also in a way becomes a, 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 a legitimacy conferring device for global actors to push together with private, uh, with, with local actors, on local authorities. So it's, it's really no one way street. I think that there are very interesting dynamics that go uh, round and, and that sometimes can, can uh, enable actually those actors and those kind of activities that you wouldn't imagine when this legal reforms took place. You're on mute, Diane. Thank you, sorry. Thank you so much. I'm just trying to wrap it up and now here I'm on, on mute. I was just gonna say that uh, Alejandro, you, Enrique and I can go on for a while. Um, and I hope this is only the beginning of a conversation. There are one or two other questions. We're not gonna be able to get to them, but I do wanna just in, in, the, in the spirit of closing and in thanking you, Alejandro, I liked very much your response about the kind of, there are other practices besides the official city practice. You are the author of a book on coalitions of the willing and international, the interplay between formality and informality. So you've thought about these kinds of ways in which the formal and informal work at multiple scales. And that's one way to think about it. Second, I would, I just wanna give you a shout out for your comment earlier, your quote of Hannah Arendt, when you're talking about law and your lament a bit about the important thinking about law, her def definition as a collective political act of promises for the future, which I think we think planning is about, but sometimes we forget to focus more on, on the future because we're so stuck in the politics of the present. It seems to me we've just had a, a study group and a conversation going on here at Harvard between faculty and planning and the Harvard Law School about kind of bringing the two disciplines together a little more. I hope you'll be able to come back and join us in that. And Ricky is a part of that. Miss some of the people in the chat are a part of that. So you've really given us a lot of food for thought today. And I want to thank you so much. I want to thank the audience uh, and the Rockefeller Center for hosting this. Paula, Lorena. I want to note that um, in uh, on November 17th, so that's in two weeks, we have one more speaker. We'll have another event called Beyond Vaccines, Health in Rural Mexico and the History of Vaccines. So we'll be able to talk about the rural, maybe some international vaccine politics as well. Um, and I hope everyone here will join us. Uh, and again, my profound thanks to Alejandro and Enrique for this very stimulating presentation and set of conversations. And thank you for joining us, everybody. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Bye. Bye.